Good evening, everyone. I'm Liz Thalheimer. I'm president of the League of Women Voters of Huntington. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan political organization that encourages informed and active participation in government, works to increase understanding of major public policy issues, and influences public policy through education and advocacy. The League never supports nor opposes any candidate for public office or political party. Welcome to the meet the candidates for a council member for town of Huntington. Uh, I'd like to introduce Diane Slavin, who will be one of the hosts tonight. Great, and thank you, Liz. Can you go to a slideshow? It's, it's it, the second slide's on. I know that, but I don't think it's in slideshow mode. That's okay, I'll move it. Okay, okay, fine. <laughs> Okay, so just a little bit more about the League. Since 1920, the League of Women Voters has encouraged and informed active participation in government, working to increase understanding of major pol public policy issues and to influence public policy through education and advocacy. The League works to register voters and to provide voters with election information through voter guides, candidate forums, and debates. The League does not support, as we Liz just said, uh, we're nonpartisan. And membership is open to everyone, not just women. Okay, next slide. Okay, so I want to introduce our candidates. Um, we have uh, Hunter Gross, Jennifer Hebert, and Joseph Schramm. Anyone wave? Uh, Hunter, I don't have on screen right now. <laughs> Um, this is, is. Uh, yes, okay. Um, we have three candidates um, tonight. This is essentially a uh, meet the candidates for the Democratic primary. Um, all candidates, I need to, I want to let everyone know that all candidates from the Democratic and Working Families parties whose names will appear on the ballot were invited to participate in the event tonight. Uh, Michael Odo did not respond. Um, Robert Smitelli has withdrawn as a candidate. And Marissa Anderson, who is running for a Huntington Town Supervisor, also failed to respond. Since there are only two candidates um, from the Working Family Party running for Town Supervisor in this primary, Rebecca San Santa, who had originally planned to participate, will not be able to. Also, Jennifer Hebert, who will be, rep will be representing the Democratic Party tonight as there is no one from the uh, Working Families Party here to oppose her. Okay, um, I want you to remember that the, in, New York, in New York State, we have closed primary elections, which means that um, you have to vote for candidates in the party with which you are uh, facilitated. So if you're registered as a Democrat, you're going to be registering. Uh, you're going to be voting for Democrats. If you're a working families can, uh, party member, you're working uh, voting for working family candidates. Okay. Um, as soon as I'm finished and I get to introduce our moderator, I'd like everybody who hasn't already be muted and turn off your video, so that all we can see on the screen are the candidates, the moderator, and the timer. Um, okay, so we are also, as everybody, um, we are going to ask uh, all, all questions, if you have questions, need to be written into the chat for vetting. Okay, all questions need to be worded so that they can be answered by all candidates. Okay, we don't, no, no question can be directed at any single candidate. Uh, we will try to cover as many topic areas as if time allows. Questions have been already been, questions that have already been addressed are questions that um, address issues that beyond, are beyond the purview of the town board will not be asked. Okay, so tonight's moderator is Lisa Scott, who's president of the Smith Town League. Our timer tonight is Barbara Reich. And our vetters are uh, Joyce Whitehead and Nancy Holliday. So at this point, I would like to uh, introduce to you Lisa 
everybody turn off your videos and we'll proceed with the uh, meet the candidates tonight. Okay. Well, thank you, the candidates. Uh, I hope you don't mind my referring to you by your first name, if that's okay. Uh, Hunter, Jen, and Joe. Uh, I've never met any of you, so hello. <laughs> um, so the debate, as uh, Liz and Diane said, uh, it, I'm referring to it as a debate because we have a structure everyone will get a turn. As has been explained, there is a rotation. The timing that everyone's agreed to, and uh, Barbara, you are holding up the, uh, the timing so people viewing it can see. You're gonna have to hold it really close because the type is small. Excellent, excellent. <laughs> um, because it, it, you, the candidate will have to be looking at the screen and thinking about their response. Um, the opening statements have been agreed upon for one minute each. Again, once you see that done sign, finish your sentence, but please don't start another thought as a courtesy to everyone. Um, the responses to the questions will be at a max of 90 seconds, a minute and a half. Uh, if you get to a point in your response and you really wish you had more time, jot down what you were gonna say and then in the closing, you can refer back to some of the things, the points you didn't get a chance to make. The closing statements themselves are two minutes. And again, that's your summary, your sales pitch to everyone. And um, we are doing, we normally do this in person by holding up a red card, but we have to do it virtually. You will each be allowed up to three rebuttals. So as Diane said, you'll just have to get my attention. And once all three of you have spoken, then if one of you wants an extra 30 seconds just to make a point on that question, you'll have three chances in the evening to do that. And I'll try to keep track of that accurately. Again, civil discourse is really important to the league and society. Uh, what's really important tonight is you're making your case that you should be someone's choice. This is not being against other people. This is making the case that you are the best candidate. So we appreciate your thoughtful answers to all of the questions. So without further ado, the order that's been done by colored pieces of paper, lots, <laughs> is that Joe will go first in the opening. Hunter, you'll go second. Then you'll go third. Then I'll start with Hunter with the first question and we'll keep rotating. And at the very end, the order of the closing is actually the same. Joe, then Hunter, then Jen. And we'll just remind people at the end of early voting and election day for the primary. So again, welcome on behalf of the League of Women Voters of Huntington. And Joe, you have one minute to make an opening statement. Well, thank you. I have always been there. I was there for Northport to improve our police. I was there for local business to help deal with the pandemic. I was there to help underprivileged kids play soccer. I was there for families struggling with Alzheimer's, for homeless veterans and abused LGBT teens. I was there the entire time volunteering my time to better our community while running my own business. I was always there to vote, 2014, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. I was there doing my part to push back the growing trend of inequity, bigotry, and favoritism. Now we are here. We can stem the tide of political patronage and put Huntington back on the right track with integrity and pride. When you elect me and Jen, we will use our unique experiences, budget capabilities, and leadership skills, and we will listen to you. So thank you, and happy Pride Month. Okay, thank you, Joe. Uh, Nancy, when you lift the cards, we couldn't see the type. It was below your video screen. So I just wanna be fair to everyone. So it has to, ah, yeah, that's good. <laughs> okay, thank you. Hunter, one minute for your opening statement. My name is Hunter Gross, I'm 25 years old, born and raised in the town of Huntington. I love the town of Huntington. I wanna raise my family here one day. Right now, that's not looking so rosy with all the crises we have in our township. We have a housing crisis. 70% of 18 to 35 year olds plan on leaving Long Island in the next five years. 
40% of 18 to 35 year olds are living at home with their parents and the national average is 16%. We have an environmental crisis. Our, our sound is toxic. We need to lead Long Island in the fight against climate change. Our local leaders in the same old status quo politics has not been working for working people in this township. It's about time we have a representative who will work and listen to you, give a voice to the working people of our town, young people and seniors who have been left out for years and it takes someone with courage to do that and I am that candidate. Okay, thanks very much for your opening statement. Jen? Thank turn. you. We have a real opportunity right now in Huntington to elect leaders who can move us in a new, better direction. And we won't have this opportunity again for another four years. And I know I don't want to waste it. Currently, town hall is a mess. It's mired in controversy. It's run inefficiently and, and ineffectively. And truthfully, it's become all but unresponsive to the needs of our community. If you ask anyone who's had to deal with our building department or our planning department, they'll tell you horror stories. In November, we're gonna enter a general election against a sitting councilman, a well-known school administrator, and a developer who has tremendous financial resources. The only way to win this election is to bring people to the table with experience. And I think Joe and I are those candidates. I have years of experience serving our community as a Board of Ed member, a proven record of responsibility managing taxpayer money, and experience being a voice for my constituents. I think I'm the right candidate for this moment. Okay, thank you very much. Now to start with our first question, and these will be 90 second maximum responses. And Hunter, you go first. What do you think are the most pressing problems facing the town in the coming year? Sure. So I believe the housing affordability crisis is our huge problem here. I've spoken to thousands of residents, young people, seniors living on fixed incomes, working families are being shut out and displaced from our town in favor of the big developers who have handcuffs on our local elected officials. It's about time we stop building luxury developments for seniors 55 and older because the vast majority of seniors in our town can't even afford to move in there. We need actually to address the housing crisis and that, you know, we're, we're going to expedite accessory apartments. We're going to create affordable housing. And it's about time that young people actually have a future here. Working families have a future here. So housing is number one. Environment is number two. It's crucial. I have the most sub substantive uh, environmental plans out of any candidate running. It's, we're going to create a townwide composting program. We're going to ban pesticides from our public parks. We're going to ban gas powered leaf blowers. I have the strongest environmental plans. If you want to finally have a township that prioritizes the environment, I'm your candidate. And number three, we need to make sure that our small businesses can recover from COVID. I've worked with small businesses for a few years now. It's crucial that we have someone in town hall who will cut the bureaucratic red tape, actually listen to our small businesses, get foot traffic back in Huntington, and let's not forget Huntington Station because those businesses are just as important as every other you know, hamlet and, and village in our township. Okay, thank you, Hunter. Jen, same question. I think that the place that I would start is again with our inefficient and in ineffective town hall. I think all roads lead back there. And once we have true leaders at that table who can look to um, cut waste and do away with patronage jobs, I think that that would do a lot to move our town hall in the right direction. At the same time, and this is a related item, we have to bring taxes down. And if we can't bring them down, we have to at least assure our taxpayers that we're using their money to the best of our abilities and getting the biggest bang for our buck. I've been a taxpayer for 25 years here and I see my taxes go up every single year and yet I see my services decline. And that's unacceptable as far as I'm concerned. Uh, the environment is a critically important issue to me. We live on Long Island. Our waters are some of the most important resources we have here. I know that our harbors need our attention I know that the runoff from um, climate change is only getting worse and it's really important that we do what we can to take care of the environment. 
And then finally, anything to do with youth is actually always really important to me. I obviously worked on a school board for nine years. Any programs I can bring to our youth and any support I can give our public schools would be of the utmost importance to me, importance to me. So that, that would be the things that would be most important. Thank okay. you. Thank you very much, Jen. Joe, your, your response? I think the most important thing is to replace the shortfall in tax contributions coming from businesses and from retail by actively attracting tax paying corporations to relocate here in our in the available office space and retail stores. You know, you just drive through Melville or along Jericho Turnpike and you can see for yourself that we are suffering from suburban blight due to empty offices and storefronts. We need to get more big business so that small businesses can have clients. Think of it like Shark Week. Uh, the big business is the shark and all the small fish around the, the shark are small businesses. I run a small business now for almost 30 years. Believe me, I need big business to help me support my business. That's the only way. So if we get more money from businesses, then homeowners will get to pay less. And that's really the most critical thing. The second thing is we don't want people to be taxed out of town. So again, I go back to one of the great ways to resolve that is by bringing in more businesses to help you know, share that burden of taxes. The, second, the next thing that I'm really committed to is the environment. And very specifically is to dredge North Port Harbor. The, it needs to be dredged. It's been over 50 years since the harbor has been dredged and we need to clean it because there's not enough oxygen and I'm tired of swimming with dead fish around me at the beach. We also need to preserve our open spaces and natural wetlands and we need to manage storm runoff. Climate change is only going to cause more storms and that means more runoff. So I think those are some of the key elements. I also would like to oh, address thank you. Thank I'd you. Also, oh, thank you. Okay, thanks. Okay, okay. Um, uh, you've all three of you have talked about a number of really important issues, um, all of which need a, a superman, superwoman to deal with. But let's take a deeper dive into some of them. So, Jen, uh, this I'm sorry, uh, Joe. Nope, me. I think Jen. I think Jen. you were right. Actually. I have a grid. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I can't remember otherwise. Um, so Jen, um, one of the first topics that came up was housing and this conflict between the type of housing that is being constructed in the community uh, balanced against the need for various types of housing. And of course, we all know right now that the housing prices have gone through the roof because mm -hmm. of the effects of COVID. Um, giving more detail now, and this is for all three of you, how would you even start a decision-making process or how would you um, try to influence what happens in housing if you were elected? If I were elected, I can tell you the first place I would start, and that would be to sit down and finally force the town board to come up with a real balanced vision for how we want development in our town. We've been doing it two piecemeal all these years. We put buildings up, they break our own town codes, they break our own zoning you know, codes that are in, and Quite frankly, I think that it's been a very reactionary way to go about development in our town. It has concerned me for years because I worry about our infrastructure and whether it's actually up to the task of supporting all that kind of development. So the first thing I would do would be to help, I would be to, to encourage the whole board to get on board to come up with a really good balanced plan. The other thing I would do, and I think Joe mentioned this, is I would look at different sites that were already built and look to recycle them and reuse them as housing because the last thing I wanna see is more of our green spaces and parks being developed and, and cemented over. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Joe? You go next. Yeah, I, I think what the first thing is to look at our planning department. I think it's dysfunctional and that we need to just get them organized. So that'd be number one. Number two is that I also, as, as Jen alluded to, I'm a big believer in not using uh, open lands that we already have, but instead I'd like to reuse and reimagine areas that are available to us. Now, also, there's not a lot of open land still left. So we really should be taking on this mentality of 
reusing and reimagining existing spaces that have already been developed. So that would be two of the most important things to do. And then I think is um, for us, oh, I have met half minute left. Okay, so uh, the next thing I think is really looking at uh, affordability. Of course, I th uh, I think what's critical is that we need to uh, make sure that we have affordable housing and allotted for individuals who really require it. So that's the third point. Okay, thank you, Hunter. Sure. So I think we need to look at abandoned commercial spaces, bowling alleys, uh, distressed hotels, which was actually just passed in the New York State Assembly and Senate this year, where there's actually going to be funding to convert distressed hotels into housing for people. Um, I think that's crucial. You know, we need multi-use development in, you know, abandoned bowling alleys and places where it will only benefit young people, seniors and working families and our small businesses that will increase foot traffic in our town. Also, we need to expedite the accessory apartments in our township. So many people have complained that they don't know about this. You know, there, there's regulations where, that there's not enough accessory apartments. Not only will this help people who are looking to find affordable options, this will help the homeowner actually mitigate costs of actually owning a home in our township, which I don't think enough people have been talking about. Um, we also need to improve and upgrade our infrastructure. Uh, so, uh, north of 25, North of the Huntington Station train tracks in Huntington Station, there's crucial upgrades that need to be uh, take place with our sewer and our and our septic tanks there. Um, I think it's crucial that we're end the relationship with the real estate developers. Okay, thank you. Um, moving on from housing, uh, another topic that came up was businesses, and there were references to small business, large business. Um, Let's take that upside down and say, let's talk about jobs. And again, the idea is jobs in the greater Huntington area so that the population can stay there. People nowadays want to work from home, want shorter commutes. Um, so if Amazon builds a warehouse in the town of Huntington, is that good or bad? What do you think? And Joe, that's you. Okay, well, you know, one of the things that got me really going and got me involved in running was the fact that I saw that Amazon was building a regional uh, headquarters and that included jobs all the way from the uh, minimum wage all the way up to top management. And they were, they're building it now in the town of Oyster Bay. And the town of Oyster Bay specifically seduced them to come there. And there was no activity from the town of Huntington to do that. So what we get is we get the, the construction of a distribution center. Of course, that creates all sorts of traffic and it's uh, the lower paying jobs. We don't get the best opportunity. And what's missing for the town of Huntington is that we need to have an aggressive, organized effort to go out and invite businesses to consider relocating here in the town of Huntington. And we're looking for specific big corporations that will bring us every level of business for every skill level from the top corporate executive to all the way down to minimum wage, because that's the only equity that we really are going to be able to develop and make sure that we're sustaining our tax base in the town. Okay, thank you. Uh, Hunter? How many more times do we see big corporations moving into all of our townships, destroying the local small businesses, and then to top it off, they're getting huge tax breaks by the Suffolk IDA. I'm not in favor of huge big corporations coming in, destroying all of our small businesses, and to top it off, then they're bringing in outside workers from Alabama and Orange County. There's an example right here in the town of Huntington with Hearts Industries. They're coming in, they wanna build, build a huge warehouse, and they're not using local union employees. What about Long Island First policies? So in order to help small businesses, which have been dying before COVID, I know because I've worked with them for many years, now they're really just being destroyed. We need to ensure that there's foot traffic in our towns. I'm gonna to create a Huntington Biz app, which ensures that the township will provide the tools and resources for uh, you know, Huntington residents to shop and buy locally. And this app will, get, will let the residents accrue points and discounts for local stores. We're also going to ease and alleviate permits for pop-up shops in the town of Huntington. I believe this is a great new idea that would, would be very fitting for certain areas of our town. I also think that it's crucial that we stop nickel and diming our restaurants. Right after COVID, the town had the nerve to charge restaurants for outdoor seating after they're being destroyed. 
We need actually a representative who's going to sit down with small businesses, ensure that they survive. And the last thing we need to do is bring in big corporations who are going to destroy small businesses, get Suffolk uh, IDA tax breaks and not hire local union workers. Okay, uh, we'll do rebuttals after all three candidates have spoken on the question. Okay, uh, Jen, it's your turn. And then anyone who wants to rebut, I'll give you 30 seconds. Well, as the daughter of a small business owner, my father, I'm very proud of my father. Uh, 60 years ago, he started a small business that was named after my, well, I should say not 60, 50 years ago, because it was named after myself and my two brothers. And he has absolutely made a go of that business. You know, this many years later, it's still up and running. And so there's n nothing that means more to me than small business owners who have the courage to strike out there and, and you know make a go of it and help support other families, which his business did. That being said, there's a place for all kinds of businesses in Huntington, and that's my feeling about it. I think there are a place for larger corporations and there are a place for small businesses. And I think as long as we make it possible for those small businesses to have the support and, and to um, have the opportunities to flourish, then I think we can do a lot of both of those things. I think the best thing we can do is attract as many good jobs here as possible. And frankly, I don't care if they come from a small business or a big corporation. I just want people in Huntington to have good solid jobs so they can pay their mortgage and their bills and support their families. So that would be important to me. I am in favor though, of trying to make sure that we, you know, use our local workers. And I think that as you know, things get built, that's always going to be important. And one last thing I would say is that the corridor along Jericho Turnpike desperately needs our attention. We need to bring businesses there. We need to revitalize that area. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Joe, did you want to rebut? Yeah, so I, I think that we can't, well, right. thank you. So we can't be demonizing big business. I, I've run my own small business now for 28 years and I would not have survived and hired all the employees I've had all these years if it was not for having big businesses as my clients. You have to have big business in order to sustain all of the employees that small businesses have. The majority of businesses in the town of Huntington are, are small businesses. And we really require or uh, uh, depend on larger businesses to be our clients. Otherwise you can't sustain it. So we have to stop demonizing big business. It's important. And, and also there are a number of downtowns that are already filled like Huntington and Northport. They're filled. They really have a lot of capacity. It's East Northport and, um, and Huntington Station that really could use some help. So I, I really think that, you know, we, we also have areas of Melville that are empty. So I, I really think if we have to include everybody, it's not fair to look at one specific area or to demonize big business because honestly, half of this town could not afford to live in the houses they live in if it wasn't for somehow big businesses sustaining them. Thank you. Okay, um, either one of you? Nope. Okay, um, I did say 30 seconds and we've established a minute for the rebuttal. So we will use the minute moving forward if anybody wants to do that um, again. Fair to everybody. Uh, the next question will start with Hunter. Um, currently, what is the town of Huntington doing to revitalize downtown? What's working? What isn't? If you were on the board, how would you shift gears? Sure. So I believe, you know, when we talk about, uh, you know, on, on uh, Larkfield Road in, in East Northport, there's prime areas of our town which needs a, a development plan that's going to work for small businesses, that's going to work for people who actually want to stay here. So I think there needs to be a mixed use development, whether it's, you know, middle housing options, uh, you know, when we're talking about duplexes and triplexes and tiny homes and tiny apartments and 3D apartments, there needs to be adequate housing for small businesses to survive. That's the key to downtowns if you look all over Long Island. You know, in the Huntington Village and all across our town, we have workers here who are working in our shops and our restaurants. They can't afford to stay here. They're moving to Patchogue and Farmingdale and that's not acceptable. So we need to sit down with our small businesses. 
We're going to, and like I said previously, we're going to cut the red tape, cut the bureaucratic fees that they're charging. Um, you know, I think it's crucial that we have a walkable area in our downtowns. And, you know, that comes along with relying less on cars. I'm appreciative for the town of Huntington for creating a bike share program. We need to expand the bike share program. Uh, I like my idea of establishing pop-up uh, stores and my business app. So there's a lot of ways that we can ensure that downtowns are effective and working for everyone. And it, you know, we need to bring green jobs to our town. Those are the businesses that are going to get young people to stay here and get young people excited to be in Huntington. You know, food trucks, that's an opportunity for us to have. And also parking is key. We need more parking in Huntington Village. So that is crucial. Okay, thank you. Jen, same question. So I think that one thing that we are learning coming off of a pandemic is that we have got to be better prepared. Our businesses need to be better prepared for emergencies and not many people really had very much of a safety net. So in order, when you walk around the downtown now area, especially in Huntington, what you see is that the restaurants have managed to survive, but a lot of the storefronts have not. And I think that we need to help support those businesses in all kinds of creative ways. And I may not have all those answers, but I'll tell you who does have those answers, the actual business owners. Because when I walk around town and I speak to them, every single one of them has a suggestion about how we could improve our town and our zoning laws and our parking in order to help support our businesses. So I think one thing that I would do right away, and I'm the this is something that comes naturally to me having served on a board of education is that you really speak to the people who have stake in the game, the, the, the people who have skin in the game. And so you get together, thank you, a group of um, business owners from different parts of the township and you ask them what their biggest concerns are and what would help them most as business owner. And I think you start from there and you work from there. But I think communication is key. And I think that, that we need to streamline things to make it easier for uh, businesses to do business in the township of Huntington. Okay, thank you. Joe? Yeah, I, well, first and foremost, I'm a very proud member of the Northport Chamber of Commerce, and I'm a big supporter of uh, Chambers of Commerce. And I think that Chambers of Commerce and other associations like Kiwanis will are all filled with individuals who have experience and business experience and have uh, foresight to look at what, what's happened in the past and what they what mistakes have been made and what we can avoid moving forward. I think that uh, you know that both of the other candidates have mentioned some great ideas and in, innovative ideas for revitalizing downtown. But you know, last night he, here in Northport, we had an amazing uh, event and it was where we invited people who are not members to come in and, and uh, meet with us. And we had the chance to talk to people about what their goals and their objectives are. And what more importantly is about the in dramatic increase of home-based businesses in the town of Huntington. And, and that is really, there needs to be a conversation that goes on about how we can move our businesses forward. So, you know, the, the ideas expressed by Hunter and Jen are terrific. I also think that we need to organize those conversations and, and we need to do that with through organizations like Chambers of Commerce or a Kiwanis or something of that nature. So I, I, I think that Huntington has a bright future and, and I think that we really have an opportunity here to build more jobs and, and uh, and, and bring more businesses back to life here. I wouldn't be doing that if I wouldn't be doing this if I didn't believe that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So again, you folks are giving me great topic suggestions and lots to talk about here. Uh, since I do not live in the town of Huntington and I'm looking at you from the outside, um, a number of you have talked about youth. And we all know that um, we've read and probably are familiar with personally and in families, um, how tough it's been on youth uh, during COVID and particularly um, adolescents. Um, what's the role of the town of Huntington in services? And because I don't want to talk about school districts now, this is you're running for town office. What, what is the role of the town? Is it does it have the facilities to offer assistance? Should there be more? Uh, and again, 
you can go with this anywhere you want, but we all know that if we're not taking care of the next generation, we're all in big trouble. So uh, Jen, you can take that one first, please. Well, you'd have to expect that I love this question. <laughs> um, and I'm not going to talk about it as a board member. I'm going to talk about it as a person who would like to sit at the town board table. It, the town board absolutely positively has a role to play in helping support our youth. There is no doubt about it. We can't all be adults that complain about the youth that we're, we're hopeless because look at what they're doing. Look at where the kids are going without providing them with opportunities and programs and support. And those could come from town hall for sure. I would like truthfully if I get in there, I would like to set up an internship program within town hall so that kids from the surrounding school districts would have an opportunity to come in and learn about public service hands on right there, right in their hometowns. The other thing I would say is I, I think that we have some wonderful parks and um, rec centers for the youth in our township, but not everywhere. We could really use more support and more resources for the kids in Huntington Station and Greenlawn. I think that they deserve a more um, robust youth center and more resources. And I would say also that for anybody who tells me that, and this is my answer to anybody that says, oh, I don't know, wait, look at the kids, they're on their phones all the time. I say to them, if you don't feel hopeful when you think about kids, you're not spending enough time with them because I spend time with them all the time and they give me nothing but hope. Okay, thank you. Joe, same question. Sure, I think uh, there, certainly the town has an obligation because if they don't uh, take uh, advantage of this opportunity to work with youth, um, they become a problem to the community. And so, you know, I, I've seen that firsthand. So, you know, as a former employee, uh, employee of the Boy Scouts of America and, and having had the Girl Scouts of the USA as my client, believe me, I'm very committed to youth development programs. And I, and I, I believe that what's most important for us in the town of Huntington is to look at uh, underprivileged kids and uh, also the largest segment uh, or the fastest growing segment of youth. And that comes from our Hispanic community primarily. And so the, we need to really have a very special focus on the Spanish speaking households in the, in the town. And, um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, I worked with very closely with Street Soccer USA and helping them uh, find uh, monies to help youth uh, play uh, organized soccer, you know, and underprivileged kids. So the fact is that we have an opportunity to reach out to this community specifically. And I think we need to do, uh, organize these efforts for, on the town level with other organizations that already deal with these communities. It could be church organizations, you know, not the church itself, but a youth organization within the within a, a, a religious organization, boy like Boy Scouts of America and Girl Scouts of the USA, which is sponsored by uh, different churches and and schools. So I think that we need to do it in partnership and and reach out um, in multiple languages. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Hunter, same question. So I believe I was the only one who actually grew up in the town of Huntington who played at all of our parks here. You know, whether it was Caledonia Park in Dix Hills or Arboretum in Melville, we have a great parks department. We have great parks. And I think it's crucial that when we're talking about our youth, we also don't forget to mention uh, the, the disabled. You know, there's ample opportunities for, our, for us to improve our parks and we need to ensure that there's ADA compliant equipment at all of our town parks townwide. I think that's crucial because everyone deserves the right to play at our park. I also, I also think that it's crucial that, you know, I agree with what Jen said, that we ensure that the youth of our town actually have an opportunity to work in town hall. It can't just be the friends and family job program, which has played town hall for years. You know, the patronage and corruption, I'm sorry, we need to have more town all job opportunities in all parts of our town. It doesn't matter where you live. So there needs to be an opportunity for the youth to get employment in towns. I also know as, as a younger person and the, the, the younger generation, they're all struggling with mental health. Mental health is a huge crisis in our township and all across our country. So we need to work with leading pediatricians. We need to work with school districts to ensure that they're getting the treatment and that they, we get to the bottom of that. And I think the town can have an important role to play on that issue. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question, we'll start with Joe. Um, one, of, one of the topics that um, comes up a lot, and, and we're going to go into this in a couple of different ways, I think, is um, to the outside, Huntington was always the type of community everybody else thought had opportunities for young people for young married working, um, you know, downtown restaurants, small business, large business. Um, but the, the one sort of little note that always come up is, but Huntington is diverse, but yet the diverse areas don't seem to come together. Could you speak to that, the, the both the, the wonderfulness of having a, a township that has lots of different kinds of people in many different ways, and yet what seems to be uh, an inability to kind of all play together. Uh, you know, I, I'm happy to speak to that. I, I am a multicultural marketing expert. Uh, that's what I do for a living. And so understanding different cultures is part of what I do. And, you know, it's a uh, and that it's really very interesting uh, that you asked this question. You know, we have a, uh, you know, we think oftentimes of the town of Huntington as only having uh, white people or people of color. But the reality is we have a very large immigration poly, uh, 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 population from Russia and from Poland. We also have a large population of South Asians coming into the community. Uh, and we also, of course, have Hispanics and, and Blacks who uh, have, have historically lived in our town for a long time. Um, the, the, what's interesting to your point of like, do we mix, is the fact that one thing that is, has always been relevant in, um, in multiculturalism is understanding that it's a double-edged sword. You know, some people, people like to be with their own kind and then people want to integrate. As a gay man, I can tell you, I love living in a neighborhood filled with families and children and, and straight people. But the reality is I also like hanging out with a bunch of gay guys. So, you know, there's a, we have to keep that in mind. And so how do you bring cultures together? You do multicultural events. You actually invite, you know, churches and organizations can start by inviting other uh, groups for ecumenical uh, uh, events. You can invite people to different. Oh, I'm out of time. I could go on forever on this one. Okay, so take thank some you. notes. You can come back to it in the close. Okay. Hunter, same question. Sure. So I agree with Joe that the township should be uh, providing more cultural events and, and town hall. You know, whether it's the Muslim community, I think it would be great to uh, celebrate at town hall, you know, Ramadan or whatever holiday uh, at, at the present time is happening, whether it's the Jewish community, we can celebrate Hanukkah. I think the town should sponsor more of these local events. Um, I think that that is crucial. You know, there needs to be proper representation. Um, you know, there's a large uh, Latino community who lives in Huntington Station. I believe Huntington Station has been neglected for years. And that is not acceptable. They have been talking about a master plan for so many years. We need to invest in our communities. There's so much work to be done. And just because, you know, regardless of, of anyone's, uh, you know, status in our country, we need representation for everyone in our township. And I think it's crucial that services be applied, you know, no matter what park is in what uh, different community. I think it's crucial that we have uh, a government that works for all of us, not just the politically connected and special interests. And I can assure everyone that there will be funding that goes to, you know, whatever park, wherever in the town it is located, this is not going to be um, decided based on where you are and where you're from. And I do believe a lot of the segregation was caused, was caused in the past by redlining and uh, racial biases by a lot of the real estate agents. So I'm glad that they are taking action in that in the New York State Senate. Okay, thank you. Jen? My husband and I moved to the Huntington area specifically because it offered the kind of diversity that we wanted to raise our children among. So I grew up in a town in uh, Nassau County that looks very much like Cold Spring Harbor, didn't have a lot of diversity. When I went away to school, I realized that the world looked very different. And when I came back to Long Island, I wanted consciously to make an effort to move to a place with diversity so my children would grow up knowing what the real world looked like. And I have to say that Huntington offered us that. And 
I don't want to agree to disagree, but I have Huntington School District has done a remarkable job of actually integrating the different um, cultures and communities together. And it's not without its challenges, but I have to say, I think we could take a page out of the way the district has gone about it. It's, uh, there, it's a few things that go into it. One is open communication and an ability to connect with people from other cultures, other families, other situations, and let them know that their voice is important. And another thing that's really important is just to make sure that, and this is something that's a little harder and a little more long-term, but in the Huntington School District, we actually set a goal of making sure that we were hiring teachers and administrators who reflected what our population looks like. And I think that, I hate to say it, but look at the three of us. You have three white people here running for positions. I think it's important that the town starts to move, it, not starts to move, it's high time for the town to hire people of color and people who are minorities so that when other people from the community go to town hall, they see people who look like them. That's what I think is important. Okay, Hunter, a rebuttal, you get a minute. Sure, so, you know, I think when we talk about the Huntington School District, we'd be remiss to talk about the challenges that they've also had there. And we're, when we're talking about communities of color, you know, during the height of the Trump administration, there was, ice raids all throughout our township and across our country. And there was 12 Latino students who were deported from Huntington High School, all because they were, they were associated with MS-13. And that, those, were those weren't necessarily the right claims. And there was not a lot of facts related to that issue. So if we want to talk about actually Huntington School District handling that situation the right way, I believe they really did insult and offend a lot of the Hispanic and Latino community there because one student was deported for drawing the Huntington High School mascot, and they associated that with MS-13. So I think when we talk about the Huntington School District, we need to be careful to say that they didn't always handle things the right way. Okay, and Jen, if you'd like to rebut as well, one minute. Sure. I was the board president at that time, Hunter, and it's lovely that you can pass judgment on how we handled it from the outside, but let me tell you about how it really worked. Sessions came to Suffolk County and visited the police departments here. All along, our school resource officers had been in our buildings handling things with our students in a way that had worked for years. Suddenly, after that visit, information was shared in a different way and pretty soon our school district was being slammed on the cover of the New York Times Magazine after working in earnest for years to try and bring our community together. I got on the school district because they closed a school in Huntington School District in the station and turned their backs on that community. That's why I ran in the first place was to get that building reopened. So I have to say, I understand what you're saying because you read that article, but we were misrepresented there. And I will stand tall today and tell you, we did everything we could in order to make things right, including asking the SROs to leave, which I got a lot of slack for. And yet I did everything I could to protect our community and I'm proud of the service that I did. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, Hunter, you're first on the next question. Um, what would you propose that would make town services available to all segments of the population? It seems that not everyone has the wherewithal to avail themselves of different services. Sure, so number one, we're actually gonna start, if I'm elected, I'm actually gonna answer the phone in town hall. I've spoken to countless number of people who try to get in touch with their council member and you know they're talking to the assistant. No one gets back to anyone, at least you know based on what I've heard. So we need true representation and true, and, and to give the people a voice back in town hall. I am glad I've been calling for a long time for an audit of the building department. I'm glad, you know, there's a lot of mismanagement there. So we need actual qualified people in town hall, not just political hacks. And I think that's crucial, and it's crucial that we cut the patronage. As far as the bus service. Let's improve the heart bus service. Let's ensure that there's adequate stops along New York Avenue. Continue and, and create new stops along Pulaski Road to ensure that all of our residents, no matter where you live in the town, you will have access to the services. We need to ensure that there is uh, surveys being sent out to the town residents. What can we do better in town hall? I'm a big believer in mobile town halls. I think it's crucial that we go into the community to have them uh, voice their opinion. In the case of Matinica Court, I'm, I think that it's crucial that we hear input from young people, seniors, and working families who need housing. 
And, you know, there's, there's an argument there that, you know, people talk that, where are they? Where are they being heard? It's our job as town officials to reach out to them because not many people are aware that they can speak out and, and, and support for a lot of these causes. So we need to, to have the most transparent and accessible town hall, and I will be that council member. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jen? Do me a favor and just read the question again for me, if you don't mind. Um, I can paraphrase it because sure. there you go. I don't have it in text. <laughs> okay. um, basically, what would you propose to make town services more available to all segments of the population? Okay, well, I think that for one thing, they could be open. I've had my nursery school open since October. I think town hall is finally just opening to live in service you know, in-person services, like as of yesterday. So for one thing, I think that they could do a better job of being open and accessible and setting hours that work for the public. I think that we need to better advertise and communicate to people when town board meetings are going on. I think that people don't always know that the meetings are going on and they don't realize that they have the opportunity to express concerns at a meeting. I also think that, like I said before, you need fresh eyes in there to look at that entire system and the way things work and start dismantling the positions of patronage that aren't useful and really start, I, you know, I think there's a lot of overlap there between different departments and different jobs and yet nothing gets done. So I would start with the planning department and the building department and I'd go from there. But I would absolutely look at where there was waste and get rid of it. We want all of our tax money to go to things that are really working for our community. And I think that the better we can um, organize and establish our systems and our departments, the better off our community will be because they'll know exactly where to find the information that they need. Okay, thank you. Joe? Sure. Uh, first and foremost, I think that we have to look at our, uh, at uh, who the taxpayers are, and we look at them as investors in the town, as opposed to, you know, looking at them as people who are coming to town hall to complain or they have a problem. Uh, you don't go to town hall unless you actually have a complaint or a problem. So I think that the next thing is to actually uh, change the, the mindset of how we interact with the public at town hall. Um, my, my life partner, Steve, went to town hall recently and got yelled at and screamed at to stand outside. So, I mean, it was just really amazing considering that we're taxpayers. And so uh, that's number one. I think that there's a customer service a, a readjustment that is necessary uh, across the board at town hall. Number two is we have to become more, um, uh, you know, accessible. And by that, I mean, we do nothing for the hearing impaired. Uh, nor do we have anything for the seeing uh, the sight impaired. So the the fact is, yes, we have handicap accessibility, but we don't uh, we don't actually have uh, somebody signing during board meetings, for example. The third thing is is like let, let's make government less intimidating. Um, you know, I hear people complain about how nobody goes to board meetings. I, have you ever watched them? I, I mean, I can't believe I can stay awake. The fact is that we actually have to make it more stimulating and interesting, and actually engage engage people so that people understand how government works. If we start reaching out to the consumer and, and um, so I'm out of time. I could go on, I'm sorry. Okay. Well, actually I'm gonna do a second round on, on something that came up, which is how do we bring government to the people since many of the people, number one, may not be taxpayers, either aren't even in that category because they could be renting or you know students or whatever. Uh, number two, um, they don't have a clue how government works, who's responsible for what. You've all heard complaints about roads and most people have no idea that there are different jurisdictions. 20 years ago, I was hearing about New York Avenue flooding. I, it probably still floods, but is it town of Huntington or not? So the, uh, the next question, which Jen will start with you is just how do we bring a better awareness and familiarity with government and interaction to everyone in the greater Huntington community? You have to make it as easy and accessible as possible for starters. And I think that coming off of a pandemic, we actually have learned some things that might be to our advantage to answer this question. 
I know none of, we're not crazy about meeting on these Zoom meetings and it would be nice to be meeting in person, but it certainly allows more people to attend than would have attended before. And so we can incorporate things just like this so that more people can make sure that they are involved in the day-to-day -day governance that affects their lives so that they can sit in on meetings and listen. We also need to have translators. We have a large population of people in Huntington for whom English is not their first language. We want them involved. We want their voices heard. If we're going to accomplish that, we're going to need people who can translate. And we also need everything in town hall to be put in several languages so that people aren't intimidated, as it was said. It's intimidating enough to walk into town hall. Now try doing it if you don't speak the language that everybody is speaking. So we need to have people so that town hall is a welcoming place and that people do realize that's your town hall. You, that's, your, that's your house. And if you need something from it, you should be welcomed and not yelled at because you entered the building. But I think that in ways like that, and, and the thing I mentioned before is I think that people who enter that building need to see people in positions of power that look like them. And I think that's really important too. Okay, thank you. Joe, same one. Yeah, I, I think that um, that I said a lot of the things I would uh, do, but I, I do really believe that, you know, I learned a lot when I was on the Northport Village Police Refor uh, Review Committee. And then we, we actually looked at the cultural uh, uh, impact of the police department. And I think town hall can be very similar, is that there is a way to reach out and, and, and actually engage the community and reach out and do these mini town hall meetings in the community and actually get engage people to in the community to ask questions of the board, town board. For example, the town board could do you know go to different communities and actually sit down and meet with business leaders meet with um the kiwanis clubs and have lunches and the and the like i apologize for my ringing bell behind me uh the um in addition to that i i think that we also have to focus more outside of the immediate uh huntington area everything's focused on huntington but you know i represent the uh east side of the town and we really feel neglected over here and i think if we do have these mobile town halls and go into meeting the communities we'll start actually engaging more people um and and i think that would really go a long way a second thing is is that i uh, one thing we did on the village uh, review committee for the police was we actually Actually had cultural training and ensured that there is cultural training for all of the employees. We would also, I would also insist that we start having customer service training for every employee in town hall. Okay, thank you. Hunter, same question. You know what? I think one way that we can actually get people interested and more informed in government and local government is to ensure that they actually feel like they're being represented. Because for so many years, I believe the same old politics and the establishment status quo has left working people, younger people, seniors who you know, aren't paying attention to local government issues in the dark. I feel like for so many years, town of Huntington has been engaging in democracy in the dark. And that's not acceptable. I think for so many years, it's about the developers, it's about the special interests, and people feel like they are not heard. So I will be a council member who actually hears you, listens to you, and share as many of the same problems as you. So we need to ensure that we have mobile units going around throughout the town where I can go out there and sit for, you know, set aside a few hours to sit with members of the community. They can come, tell, tell us what their concerns are. Big problem, small problem, that's my job. This is not my seat. This is the people's seat. And that's why I'm running, because we actually need a representative in town hall who cares about the people, not the special interests. You know, for years, you know, for, for a few months now and a few weeks, there's this property uh, in South Huntington that the community wants answers. And I know it's a tough situation. I was at the second precinct community meeting, but it would be nice if more town officials actually go to more community meetings, not just photo ops and ribbon cuttings. Okay, thank you. Uh, Joe, the next one starts with you. Um, what is your vision for a green Huntington in terms of services or innovations? Uh, well, so first and foremost, 
I, I think anyone who's watched my video knows that I love to bicycle ride. So I think uh, we need to encourage people to commute in other ways other than their automobile. And so whether that's with bicycles or pedestrian traffic or, or um, doing it, uh, you know, with uh, mass transit, we need to focus on, you know, transportation as, as a primary focus. And that will also affect uh, you know, the overall environment of the community. The second thing is I, you know, uh, it, we, let's be we, bite-sized pieces. One thing that can really dramatically improve the environment is interior. We can encourage people to have green walls. They're not terribly expensive to install. I mean, they're plants on a wall and they, they are amazing. They change attitudes within, of, of people in a workplace or a restaurant. It also freshens the air. And so it's a very economical way to change our environment that we live in, and it changes our attitudes. Um, so I, I briefly mentioned bicycling. So I'm a big believer and proponent in bicycle and pedestrian safety, but I also think that we need to create uh, segregated bicycle lanes, much like Route 347, uh, where the bicycles are outside of the traffic lane. And so if we do that, we'd encourage more bicycling and less traffic. That will help to reduce uh, uh, gas emissions and the, and the like. So it's just a few starting points. And I'll, I could go on again, but I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, Hunter, your turn. I'm running to ensure that we have a sustainable and habitable future for town of Huntington residents. It would be nice for seniors to know that their children and grandchildren will be okay and safe in a sustainable economy. And sorry, a sustainable environment. We can't just wait for the federal government and the New York State legisl legislature to act. We can act on the town level. Number one, we're going to create a townwide composting program. The town of Brookhaven has already done just that, and we're going to do it here. Number two, everyone's favorite, we're going to ban gas-powered leaf blowers. Every other village who's been uh, studied this issue knows that this is a nuisance. It's an environmental nuisance. It's annoying, and there's no reason why we need gas-powered leaf blowers. Number three, we have a toxic sound. We're going to ban fertilizers from, and pesticides from town parks. That is a way to limit some of the runoff going into our sound. Number four, Huntington Quadrangle. There's buildings 25,000 square feet or larger. We're going to mandate solar roofs on those buildings. There's no reason why with all that ample space, we can't be leading on that issue. We have a great heart bus system. This is our town's bus service. We should invest in a hydrogen powered bus. Let's leave Long Island in climate. There's no reason why we should take a back seat on this issue when we're, we've been, we're in the progressive forefront with the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratories. Let's work with local universities to advance the climate action agenda. And I will be a council member who actually has the plans to get things done. Okay, thank you. Jen, same one. So when you talk about the environment and initiatives to help protect our environment, I think that you, there are big solutions and there are small solutions. And I think that they're all valuable. The big solutions, obviously, we have climate change happening around us and it's only getting worse. So it's really important that everything we do in terms of the town is now acknowledging that and trying to counteract the damage that is being done. I think any building that we can do with renewable resources and any recycling that we can do in terms of buildings being reused and, and reimagined as other spaces is going to be very important. That's a big kind of an idea. On a small idea, much the way Hunter talks about the compost pile, which by the way, I have a compost pile at my house. I, I'm a big fan of that. I would like that idea. I'd also my husband and I keep bees. And so what we've learned through keeping bees is how important our native plants are to our environment. Our native plants have been forced out by a lot of invasive, very decorative plants that were brought over from Europe. A small idea would be to make sure that every park in Huntington establishes a native garden. Then that would help the environment. I know it seems like a small thing. It's a very little money to do. And yet the benefits would be tremendous over time. And so I think small ideas like that, I think encouraging recycling. Our recycle, the schools don't even necessarily have a functional recycling program. You can imagine how much paper gets thrown away, how many plastic bottles. The town could certainly help support other ideas like that, that are again, small ideas with a, with a really great payoff in the end. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, 
next one, Hunter, we start with you. So you end up as a certified candidate on the general election ballot. You win, you're in. How much influence are you going to have to get things done? We spent most of the time talking about goals, but we all know from Washington to the state and everywhere, it takes two to tango or more. So how about an assessment of what you think can be accomplished by consensus along the board and what, where are the struggles gonna be? Sure, so I think that's, this is a great question. Uh, I previously, I'm the only one here who has local government experience. I worked in the most corrupt patronage filled Republican town filled town of Hempstead. There was never any Democrats there for 150 years. We got in as the first democratic administration and, and with a majority Republican workforce, by the way, we collaborated on issues, you know, the supervisor did, and we were a part of the team that actually ensured that we sit together and get things done. I think I can work with anyone whether it's a Democratic supervisor who's elected, which I hope so, or the Republican supervisor is elected, I believe I'm a very approachable, pers uh, an approachable person. We need to end the tribalism in town hall and throughout Long Island. You know, we're not gonna agree on everything, but what we do agree on, we need to sit down and ensure that we're delivering for the residents of the town of Huntington. You know, this is, we can't take things personal. Yes, there are issues where we won't agree, but our job is to deliver for the town residents. Let's come up with a consensus, what we do agree on. So a, you know, an issue with gas power leaf blowers. I think you know, these are not uh, bipartisan issues. You know, ensuring that there's um, you know, banning pesticides from our parks so we stop the runoff in, into, uh, into our sound. There's so many issues, housing, that is not a Republican or Democratic issue. There's a lot we can do and I have the experience to work with the other other uh you know council members who are on the other side of the aisle okay thank you jen this is a really great question i agree with hunter and it's the reason why i haven't been knocking on doors and making promises i learned 10 years ago when i got on the board of ed that you may think you're going to get on there and you're going to get things done and by that first month you're going to have bought those buses for that school district but what you realize when you get there is there's only so much that you can do within your purview. And so the, the job of somebody who's a really good leader is to figure out exactly how much you can get done and then go to work. And I have experience doing that. I worked on a board. I worked with people who were from all different sides of the aisle. And I actually pride myself on being somebody who's a really good consensus builder, somebody who's an excellent team player, but also somebody who knows how to make a difficult decision and then stand firm in my decision, knowing that I've made it for the right reasons. So if I get in the position in town hall, I am looking forward to being as effective as humanly possible, but also recognizing that I don't wanna make promises I can't keep. And so you learn on the job in a job like this. It's unfortunately, you don't get to go to training to learn to be a board of education member. You don't get to go to training to learn to be a town council member. You learn on your feet. I'm a quick study and I'm a strong decision maker. And I really think that a strong female voice at that table is, is needed at this time. I think women go about solving problems and dealing with conflict differently. And I think that the perspective that I bring to that town board would be really very helpful. Okay, thank you. Joe, same question. Yeah, I, I, well, you know, I think it's, it's interesting. I, I have spent my uh, career uh, dealing with people in all different roles and, and it's really a matter of understanding relationships. So the first thing I would do was recognize what the job of a town council member is. And you have a responsibility of holding the public trust for how the budget is spent. And so, you know, ultimately all of my relationships that I've developed over my uh, volunteer career as well as my business career have been about uh, being entrusted with other people's money. My clients trust me with mil multi-million dollar budgets. I know that the voters and the residents of the town of Huntington can trust me to have the same kind of care about how our town spends their money. So that is number one, is like really understanding what things cost and how to spend money and how to allocate it. And then really understanding who does what in the, in the town. 
And, you know, not everything is always so obvious, you, you know, and so there's a necess necessity to understand, even though someone may have a title, it doesn't necessarily mean that they do the job. Getting things done means knowing who's going to get the job done and, and then having a great working relationship with everyone. Even if you don't really intrinsically get along with that individual, you have to get along in order to get things done for our voters. Okay, thank you. So I'm going to give you all one more question and then we'll go to the closing statements. And this one actually um, will take off where you just were, but I'm going to go a little further down that line. So not only do you win the primary, not only do you win the election, but after your term is over, you got elected to some higher office. You're no longer on the board or even the supervisor. You're elsewhere. What's your legacy? What's the big thing you did? And that starts with Jen. No, yes, Jen. I'd like to leave a legacy of leaving Huntington a better place than when I started. And it's almost as simple as that. There are obviously specific things that I'd like to see done. I think I've mentioned some of them. I'd like to see Hunt Huntington Town Hall work better for its community. I'd like to see the waste cut so that taxpayers' dollars are being spent the best possible way. Ideally, I'd like to see a youth center for the kids in Huntington Station. Um, I'd like to see our environment protected. I'd like to see a master plan of development for our township. I wanna see our town with elected leaders who both recognize that there are needs that are not being met in our community and it's time that we make take action and make sure that those needs are met, but also that we have plenty of people here who love and appreciate our town, who have great ideas about how to make it better. So I'd like to be that council person who is always accessible, who's a great listener, who's a woman of action, who makes strong decisions on behalf of her community and leaves it better than when she started. Okay, thank you. Joe, your legacy. My legacy. Well, okay, great. Well, first of all, my legacy would be that people would recognize that finally the eastern side of the town of Huntington matters to, Hunt, uh, to the town of Huntington, to town hall. So to, and I'd make sure that East Northport, the downtown around the train station would be redeveloped. Uh, number two, I really want to in increase the, uh, the jobs in the town by 10%. Number three is that I would like to leave the town with a, a, a cash surplus. And number four, I'd like to be able to actually have a budget one year that did not increase the taxes. And I mean, under that 2% cap, or, you know, we don't, we need, don't need that. And finally, that we dredge Huntington, uh, Northport Harbor, so that it can be clean, and fish don't die. And so those, that's my legacy is I want people to, you know, sit on a sailboat one day and say, wow, what a great, what a great thing. We didn't, didn't cost us more to live here. Okay, thank you. And Hunter, your legacy. Sure. So I want to change these poll result, these poll results that have encouraged me to run in the first place. There's no reason why 40% of 18 to 35 year olds should be living at home with their parents when the national average is 16%. So we're going to finally address the housing affordability crisis in this town. Young people, working families and seniors living on fixed income will actually have a place in the town and they will not be displaced. We're going to be the leaders on Long Island in the fight against climate change. We're going to have the strongest climate agenda on Long Island. And that in itself would be very fulfilling to me knowing that I'm leaving this township better for the next generation. That is crucial. We're also going to ensure that our small businesses can survive. They're disappearing. You walk down Main Street in Huntington, empty storefronts all over. East Northport, Larkfield Road, Elwood Shopping Center, they're all disappearing. So we're going to have a town council member who actually is going to listen to them work with them and ensure we come up with new innovative ways to keep them here. You know, and finally, you're actually going to have the most accessible and responsive council member in town history. I believe I might be beat Jim Gorin's record. He was 20, 26, I'll, I'll still be 25, but you will have the most accessible and representative town council member in history. And I'll take pride in representing the people, not the special interests in the developers. 
Okay, thank you. And now you each have uh, two minutes for your closing statement. And again, we'll do the order of the opening. So Joe, you will go first, then Hunter, and Jen, you'll do the wrap up and then I'll close the evening. Okay. Right. Well, thank, thank you very much. And thanks for your great questions. It's been uh, terrific. So I, I'm not a career politician. Anyone can see that. I'm not interested in developing another career. I have a career. I have a successful business and I, a business that almost went out of business because of COVID, but I was able to pivot it and change it and bring it back to profitability. And that takes tenacity and that takes a commitment to getting things done. And it takes experience. And I am experienced and I'm experienced at managing businesses and managing people. And when you're on the town board, you're responsible for managing the projects and interacting with people who implement those projects. So I have experience in doing that and a great track record for that. I'm a homeowner and that means I have skin in the game. Yes, you know, voters include people who rent in our community and, and, and other people, of course. But as a homeowner, you're different because you're the one who has to pick up the check all the time. And so the, the bottom line is, is that I specifically believe that we have to have a new regard for our homeowners and think of them as investors in the town. That doesn't mean I negate anybody else who's a voter or resident here. It just means that we have to take on a new respect and attitude for the people who foot the bill and, and the people who have skin in the game. And so that's really where my position on that. And I believe that I also will bring integrity to the project, uh, to uh, town hall. And uh, you know, the bottom line is, I also feel very strongly that I'm electable. I would also be the first gay candidate and the very first gay member of the town uh, board. Not that that makes a difference, but it would add some diversity. I do get it. I'm white. I am male. I understand that, but I'm gay and I'm very proud of it. And I think that it's an important element for us to understand that the town of Huntington can really listen to other other people's and other cultures in order to make it a great place to be. And I'm done, I'm sorry, <laughs> thank you. Okay, Hunter, you're closing. Huntington Democrats, you have a very important choice in this election. We can continue with the same old machine establishment politics with the status quo has left us on both the Democratic side and the Republican side where we have younger people, working people, and seniors leaving our township. Our environment is crumbling. Our drinking water is contaminated. Our small businesses are leaving. I'd encourage you to go to my website, hunterforhuntington.com, where you can see I am the candidate who actually has plans on day one to get something done in each of these different topics. I will be someone who is the most electable in the general election because people are so disillusioned, disillusioned with local politics and local, local government where they feel that they truly are not represented anymore. I have knocked on thousands of doors in this township. People are so angry and they have a right to be angry because they truly don't feel like they are being heard. I will hear you. I am not beholden to anyone. I am not beholden to the machine politics which has plagued our town for years. I will be your representative, just me. I am not listening to anyone, it is just me. And I think everyone would love to have skin in the game, but they can't afford to stay here. And to single out people who aren't homeowners is why I'm running because people wanna be homeowners here. So we need strong housing affordability policies which will actually keep people here. Working families wanna stay here. They're working two and three jobs and they're being forced out. That is not okay. And I have the plans to keep working families here. I have the plans to keep seniors here. I have the strongest environmental plans out of any candidate running. And I believe I will be the most electable candidate in the November election because I am different than what we've had before. Okay, thank you. Jen, your closing statement. I wanna say thank you to all of you, the League of Women's Voters for um, offering us such a wonderful forum to get to meet some voters. And I wanna thank everybody that logged on for coming out and trying to learn more information about your candidates. I think that's as important as anything that I have to offer you is that, you know, I really appreciate that we have some smart and, um, and, and knowledgeable voters out there. 
And so you've come here because you're trying to figure out who you should vote for. There are three of us, there are two spots. You're trying to figure out who are the right candidates and, and it's wonderful that you have some nice choices. I'm gonna tell you why I think I'm the best candidate. I have the experience that you need for this moment on the town board table. I have served at a board table before. I've worked congenially and, and um, really well with people who come from all different sides of the aisle, as I said, and people who have very different um, ideas about how things should hand, be handled. And yet I've always, always managed to maintain a respectful relationship with everybody at the board table. And I have widespread support in Huntington from Democrats, Republicans, independents alike, because they know that when I came to the job, I literally came to the job to do the very best I could for their students and their kids and our taxpayers. And for nine years, that's exactly what I did. I'd like to remind you because sometimes there's mention of being beholden to special interests. Let me remind you that as a Board of Education member, I served nine years for free. It was an elected volunteer job. In other words, I volunteered hours and hours of my time to help our community. Therefore, I already have a record you can take a look at, a record that I'm supremely proud of, a record of experience and integrity. And I, I think I am the right candidate for this moment. I think what we need right now is experience. We don't have time to, to have to really learn on the job, although we're all gonna do that. But I think a couple of us start with a lot better experience. And I think that's something that's very important when you're talking about a town council job. So yep. vote for me. Thank you for being here tonight. Thank you. And again, all three of you are passionate, you're knowledgeable. Um, we wish you all well. It's, I think, uh, a testament to the town of Huntington that strong people want to serve the community. And I hope you all go on to doing other things in that realm. Uh, a reminder to everyone watching, uh, early voting has already started. It will go through uh, June 20th. There's always skip the Monday where you can't vote anywhere. And then the election itself, the primary is on Tuesday, the 22nd. Um, the League of Women Voters of Huntington is recording the video and audio of this. It will be posted on their YouTube channel. Um, and I encourage you to share that with your friends and neighbors. And we wish you well. So, thank you very thank you. much for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Thank you for coming. Thanks for having us. Good night. Good night.